On behalf of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Role of Technological Job Displacement in the Future of Work. My name is Cha Cha Chang, and I will be your moderator. Before we get started, I would like to let all of our attendees know that the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, which was launched in 2019, and its corresponding work groups have many ongoing and upcoming activities. The initiative launched its webinar series last year. Three webinars a year are hosted, each focused on one of our nine future of work priority topics. This is the fourth webinar in the series. You can view the previous webinars on the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative webpage. Also be sure to join us later this year for two more webinars in the series. If you would like to learn more about the series and the initiative, please do visit our website. Without further ado, let me introduce your moderator and the two speakers for today. I am Cha Cha Chang. I coordinate, uh, I'm a coordinator in the NIOSH Office for Total Worker Health and NIOSH Healthy Work Design and, cross, and Wellbeing Cross Sector Program. I lead collaborations to share research and identify promising practices for advancing worker safety, health, and well being. I am, uh, my previous work in the uh, NIOSH Office of the Director included leading enrollment outreach for the World, Center, World Trade Center Health Program and serving as liaison to the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health. Within NIOSH for Total Work Health, Office for Total Work Health, I'm very proud that we released the NIOSH Worker Well Being Questionnaire last year. Your first speaker will be Dr. Naomi Swanson. Dr. Naomi Swanson is a senior science advisor in the NIOSH Division of Science Integration and co-manager for the Healthy Work Design and, cross and Wellbeing Cross-Sector Program. She is an active member of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, where she brings a unique perspective on how different future of work focal areas, such as technological job displacement, impact worker safety, health, and well-being. Dr. Swanson received her MA in Experimental Psychology specializing in perception, cognition, and memory, and her PhD in industrial engineering, specializing in social technical systems and office ergonomics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her second speaker will be Shannon Mead. Shannon Mead is the executive director of Bloomer's Workplace Policy Institute, WPI, where she advocates on behalf of the employer community to affect workplace policies at the state and federal levels. Additionally, Ms. Mead is the executive director of the Emma Coalition, a WI Future of Work initiative, taking a prominent advocacy role in the growing fields of artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, and the gig economy, and the resulting effects of technology-induced technology displacement of employees tied in the workplace and in the workforce. Prior to this, she was vice president of public policy and legal advocacy for the National Restaurant Association. Ms. Mead also previously worked as a senior policy advisor at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where she was engaged in legislative and regulatory matters impacting the business community. Ms. Mead received her undergraduate degree from Emory and Henry College and her law degree from the Anthony Scalia Law School at George Mason University. And with that, Dr. Swanson, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we can get started. Thank you, Cha Cha. It's great to be here today. Um, next slide, please. Um, techn technological job displacement is a priority topic for our future of work initiative here at NIOSH. So I'll start my presentation with our future of work definition of technological job displacement. Um, technological job displacement happens when jobs or job tasks that are traditionally performed by humans are replaced by technology. An important thing to note is that technological displacement interacts with all the other priority topics of the Future of Work Initiative. Next slide, please. It certainly affects the way that organizations and jobs are designed and work arrangements. Um, and artificial intelligence is behind um, many of the changes in work tasks that we currently see and will see going forward. Robots, of course, are one of the most feared types of technology when it comes to job displacement. Uh, demographics affect 
um, job displacement, for example, who is most vulnerable. Job displacement affects economic security, particularly if the replacement jobs have lower pay and benefits and security. And finally, skills both influence the rate of technological job displacement and the adjustment to it. Next slide, please. And I'm sorry, go back, please. Um, and within the job displacement topic, there are numerous subtopics of importance, uh, many of which Shannon and I will be covering today in our presentations. There are the types of technology that are fueling job displacement, such as automation and digitization, and the effects of displacement on jobs. Next slide, please. I'll start with a little bit of history to remind all of us that um, technological job displacement has been a concern for hundreds, um, if not thousands of years. Humans have used machines for hundreds of years to make their work easier and safer. safer. Uh, for example, better agricultural equipment, improved modes of transportation and so forth. Um, the industrial revolution though was uh, quite a shock in Western society and transformed the workplace. It had traumatic effects. Um, we've all learned about the Luddites destroying the textile machinery that was taking their jobs as skilled artisans. So there are longstanding fears about what automation can do to workers. And the pace of change has been increasing rapidly, much more so in the past, which can fuel our concerns about how technology will affect the need for human labor in the workplace. Today's technology involves smart machines and processes. There isn't much of a limit on its reach. The machine and equipment can be installed pretty much anywhere. Robots themselves are increasingly working alongside humans as assistants, and it is likely that in the future, they will be in some type of coworker role. Next slide, please. As I mentioned previously, there's a great deal of fear about automation and particularly robots taking jobs from us. In the most dystopian scenarios, every job will be automated and humans will be completely replaced. The opposite view is that automation will take over all the undesirable and dangerous jobs, leaving humans with the most fulfilling jobs and very safe workplaces. And the truth probably lies somewhere in between these two viewpoints, particularly given the um, complex effects of automation. Next slide, please. There are widely varying estimates of the impact of automation on jobs, ranging from a low of 9% to a high of 50% of current jobs that could be automated. Automation could have three types of effects on jobs. Humans could be replaced in a large number of jobs, with that number increasing with advances in technological capabilities. Automation will shift the types of jobs done by humans or transform jobs, but won't replace many jobs. There will be automation of some tasks, but not um, replacement of the jobs. There will be a net increase in jobs because of the increased productivity and innovation from technological change. Next slide, please. Um, I. <laughs> I clearly remember when the Frey and Osborne paper came out. Sometimes this is called the Oxford study because um, it became huge news because of its predictions about job loss due to technology. Um, they were predicting that up to 50% of US jobs could be lost. Um, Frey and Osborne focused on the potential for technological substitution and automation by occupation. And they used task descriptions from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics PONET system, along with um, judgments of the potential for automating different tasks done by a panel of experts. For over 700 detailed US occupations, they concluded that by 2023 to 2033, uh, 10 to 20 years from when they wrote their paper, that 47% of US jobs were at high risk to automation and that low wage occupations and occupations requiring less education were particularly at risk. Next slide, please. Um, that study really made people uh, sit up and pay attention to the possibility of many people losing their jobs in the near future. And it was followed by several studies that took a look at the effect of automation on jobs um, 
on job displacement from some different angles. Um, Arndt et al. in 2016 argued that the whole occupational analysis that was done by Frey and Osborne overestimates the homogeneity of work within occupations and that it underestimates the activities within occupations that are hard to automate. Their focus was on worker reports of tasks that they performed in their jobs. And when they took this approach, they estimated that 9% of US jobs were at risk of replacement by technology. Then the McKinsey Institute took a similar kind of approach of examining the risk for, of automation of tasks within occupations. And they focused on the complexity of tasks within occupations. Um, they formed seven task groups and three, three of these task groups were deemed to have high potential for automation. Those with predictable physical work, those um, with data processing and data uh, collection. Next slide, please. They um, deemed four task groups to have a much lower potential to be automated. Um, those that had unpredictable physical work, um, personal interactions, decision-making, planning, and creative tasks, and managing and developing people. And overall, they estimated that in 60% of occupations, up to 30% of activities could be automated. Next slide, please. Um, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, weighed in around this time as well. And keep in mind, that the BLS has decades of experience predicting and projecting occupational trends. They have more than 100 years of data, and these data show no instance of longstanding substantial employment loss due to technological change. In their projections of future labor force participation by occupation between 2016 and 2026, they projected few occupations with job loss and an overall employment growth of 11.5 million jobs. Their conclusion was that technological change and employment growth are not incompatible. Next slide. Um, I thought it would be interesting to, to um, tell what AI experts have said about the impact of technology on jobs. There was a recent study by Gritzmacher and colleagues that surveyed um, attendees of three uh, 2018 AI conferences, and they asked them about AI labor displacement of workers. And they projected that 22% of tasks that humans currently do for pay could be automated with existing AI. Within five years, 40% of tasks, and within 10 years, 60% of tasks. And then um, AI systems would be able to automate 90% of human tasks in 25 years, and 99% of human tasks in 50 years. Next slide, please. Um, we as occupational safety and health researchers and professionals know how important it is to get the worker viewpoint on this issue. And I'll summarize a couple of studies that did this. Uh, McGinnis and all used data from the European Skills and Jobs Survey a survey of um, European Union workers to develop a measure of what they called skills displacing technological change or SDT. Their interest was in the association between technological change, the task content of jobs, and the skill formation or skill mismatch in EU workers. And the results were interesting. 43% of EU workers had experienced recent changes in the technology they used. 52% of workers reported that it was moderately or very likely that several of their skills would become outdated within five years. Next slide. The sectors where worker skills were most at risk of being displaced were IT, the financial services, utilities, professional, scientific, and technical services with um, again, IT, managerial, health, and engineering occupations most at risk. Next slide. The workers who scored high on their skills displacing techno technological change or SDT measure were those that had higher skills, higher education, and more on the job training and upskilling, not what you would have expected. Um, slide 21. Next slide. 
Kozak and um, his colleagues analyzed Euro barometer data from EU members and found the majority of EU workers were concerned about automation replacing jobs. Workers who had lower educational levels and that were in manual jobs had higher automa automation insecurity. Workers from European Union countries for advanced technology was more widely applied had significantly less automation insecurity. Next slide. Um, there are a number of things to keep in mind about the job replacement projections out there. Um, one is that automation doesn't have binary effects. It doesn't just create jobs or replace jobs, rather it transforms jobs. And we have ample historical evidence of this across all industry sectors. Second, the job displacement projections aren't being examined to see how they may differ from economic baselines, um, how they differ from the backdrop of normal workforce movement. Um, you, need to take, you need to take into account the labor force turnover that occurs in a shifting and innovative economy. For example, in 2018, in any given month, 3.4 to 4% of the total workforce left a job. Third, technological changes aren't necessarily unidirectional, but technology can make workers more productive. It can enhance skills, which can lead to higher wages, or it can replace people. And uh, an example is that there's some evidence that more productive manufacturing firms that that adopt robots had substantial increases in output and increases in jobs. Number four, automation and AI can be costly to implement and it takes time and capital to diffuse across an industry. Automation doesn't happen instantly. And as I'll point out in a bit, may be more costly than not implementing it. Number five, um, you have to question the notion that technology can automate any task given enough data for pattern recognition. I think the jury's still out on this assumption given the progress with automation and AI that we've seen thus far. Next slide, please. Some other factors to keep in mind about automation. Um, technological changes by themselves are not the only thing that affect the spread of automation. When human labor is replaced by automation, the price of goods generally goes down. However, when the price is cheaper, the demand for goods or services may increase. Thus, the need for human labor may not change or it may increase. The lower costs of some goods and services may free up money in people's budgets to afford other goods and services. And this can increase the need for human labor for these other goods and services. Also getting rid of routine tasks can free up workers to focus on non-routine and creative aspects of jobs. Next slide, please. Looking at technological impacts, um, numerous analyses indicate that low wage jobs are at highest risk of automation. However, low wages may actually slow the speed of automation and in a way be productive for those jobs for some time. It's more economical not to automate those jobs and uh, if it's not, if it is more economical not to automate those jobs. And then as technology costs decrease and low labor costs are no longer an advantage, then technology will replace the jobs. And you need to keep in mind also that some low pay jobs will likely not be automated for a long time, if ever. And these are jobs such as childcare, home health care mainly because of the social aspects that are required by the job. There are labor market considerations. Um, new technologies require new skills and skill gaps and shortages can slow the adoption of automation. There are regulatory and social acceptance considerations. People have to accept and trust the new technology and the regulation uh, framework needs to catch up with it. And there are demographic changes that can affect the adoption of technology as well. Um, an example could be the aging of the population, which um, may affect the mix of skilled labor that's available for elder care and create demand for more technological help and caregiving. Next slide, please. 
Um, job displacement can have very serious consequences for workers. Um, research has found that workers that are in occupations that are at high risk of, of automation were less likely over the long haul to remain employed and had higher rates of disability and mortality. Uh, there can be gender issues with technological changes. Some jobs that are dominated by women workers, such as clerical jobs, may be at greater risk of technological job displacement. Workers with chronic illnesses that are at substantially greater risk of displacement. Jobs that they are in tend to be lower wage, lower skilled jobs. And workers displaced by technology can have more difficulty finding new employment, and that employment may be a downgrade in skills and wages. Next job, please. Or next, um, next slide, please. Automation can benefit workers. Um, it can create entirely new tasks and jobs, such as piloting drones. It can do tasks and activities that can easily be done by humans, such as analyzing big data. It can work in unhealthy or dangerous environments, such as hazmat situations, or it can perform dangerous manual tasks. Next slide, please. It can enhance human capabilities. For example, exoskeletons can allow workers to lift heavy loads safely and assistive devices for people with disability allow them to do work they otherwise might not be able to do. Slide, next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, uh, automation is happening at an increasing pace and it's gonna impact almost all occupations. Jobs that are highly routine and amenable to automation are at most risk. We are likely to see short-term displacement from technological change, but in the long term, historically, there are employment gains. Next slide, please. The thing um, that is certain is that automation is gonna change jobs. This is gonna create a greater demand for more educated workers, especially those with technology and soft skills. Um, creative decision-making and interpersonal skills will be emphasized. These are skills we can't automate. And there will be a new specialist um, role. There will be new specialist roles such as big data, AI, and machine learning specialists and robotics engineers. And employers are going to have to um, commit to lifelong learning, reskilling, and, and upskilling for their labor forces and make education of their employees a priority. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Shannon, please. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Naomi's last point is an excellent segue, uh, I think, into my presentation today. Uh, it's good to be with, with you this afternoon, and I very much appreciate the opportunity. Next slide, please. So let me just give you a little bit of um, detail about my organization and our coalition so that you understand our perspectives on, on some of these issues. Um, Littler Mendelssohn, we are the largest management side labor and employment law firm in the world. Um, Littler's Workplace Policy Institute is essentially the uh, government affairs, the policy and advocacy arm of the firm. Uh, we uh, provide our clients with a lot of insights and intel into what is happening here in Washington, D.C. and around the, the, the states on, you know, a variety of uh, labor and employment uh, policy developments. And we work uh, with the employer community at large uh, through coalitions and through other business groups um, on a variety of legislative and regulatory matters. And I like to think of us, I, I am a registered federal lobbyist of, you know, really influencing workplace policies that um, are advantageous to our clients. And we're working, you know, through that, both at the executive, the legislative and the, and the judicial branches of government. The Emma Coalition, uh, this is our Future of Work initiative, our, our Future of Work Coalition. Um, I was previously um, at the National Restaurant Association overseeing their policy team there and um, joined with 
um, WPI to form this coalition because, as you know, the restaurant industry is very labor intensive uh, industry and you know, already before COVID, there was a lot of um, investments and efforts underway, you know, to really um, um, focus more on, you know, uh, ways to automate certain job functions. And so, you know, it just really made a lot of sense to partner with WPI to, to form this coalition. We created it as a nonprofit, a nonpartisan organization. It's its own 501c3 um, and really working with employers and employees to prepare for what we call uh, what we trademarked as the techno technology induced displacement of employees, which what we call TIDE. Next slide, please. So this caption, the age of disruption, um, you know, really captures what we have all been through the last couple of years, given the impacts of COVID-19. And, and now this series of concurrent challenges we are all dealing with today coming out of this pandemic, which obviously includes worker dislocation. You know, for example, in my previous industry, the restaurant industry alone hemorrhaged over 2 million job losses. Many of those workers have moved on to other jobs and in other industries and in other sectors and are not coming back, all contributing to, you know, the, the labor shortage issue. The great resignation, you know, you hear a lot about this today. Um, over 4 million people during the pandemic actually quit their jobs for a variety of reasons. You know, some were in uh, very public facing posi uh, positions. Uh, others had uh, childcare issues. Uh, many were over the age of 55 and just decided, you know, to take early retirement, leave the workforce altogether. There are projections. Uh, that many more will continue uh, to quit their jobs this year. Forbes is reporting that 79% of employed job seekers believe that they can make more money by switching jobs and staying put in their current uh, position. So, you know, I think the great resignation is not over and I don't think it's ending anytime soon, I'm afraid. I think this is going to be uh, something we continue uh, to, 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 to look at. And, you know, obviously I'd be remiss if I didn't miss, mention the supply chain disruption. You know, this consumer pent up demand for goods and services that's outweighing supply today. And obviously inflation on the rise, prices are going up on everything. That's including groceries, transportation, the cost of cars, you know, making it really hard on working families, really hard on people trying to get to and from work. Um, so, you know, from an employer uh, perspective, operating a business in a pandemic with a crushing labor shortage, with new employment laws on the way, um, you know, new regulations coming from the Department of Labor, from the National Labor Relations Board, uh, you know, all of this presents a number of challenges. And, you know, many businesses simply don't have the resources to thrive in an environment of booming demand and short supply, high inflation, tight labor market, stress supply chains, dwindling liquidity, increased compliance costs, all of these things are putting massive strains on many small businesses. Many small businesses, obviously, the job creators in this country and all of that really impacting um, the workforce and, and the employees. So I think, uh, you know, with all of these challenges playing out, we have to ask ourselves, what are we missing while we're watching COVID-19 play out? And I think what is happening is, is, the digital transformation is accelerating. It was already on this trajectory, but I think COVID-19 has obviously accelerated the digital transformation. And with that, we have dueling problems. You know, workers are unable to find good paying jobs that fit their skills, and employers are struggling to hire skilled workers for these in-demand jobs and these emerging roles, hence the skills gap. Obviously strong, investments in long-term um, um, 
uh, training is critical. Naomi talked about the need for upskilling and reskilling. Obviously, substantial investments are needed to and are critical to solving these challenges and the skills mismatch that we all talk about. Um, we also have to ask ourselves, you know, what are these jobs of the future given this accelerated digital transformation that's underway? Are we able to accurately predict the jobs of the future? Next slide, please. This slide um, is somewhat repetitive, but I think it sums it up uh, of where we are with respect to this unpredictable work environment, a seismic seismic shift in how employers are operating today um, and just these evolving workplace policies. Next slide. So, you know, this is where we are, a uh, workforce shortage and skills gap. Uh, every employer, every company we talk to, recruitment and retention is top of mind. It's a top priority. It's something everyone is dealing with in one way or the other. I mentioned, you know, employers are needing to hire for positions. We hear this every day. Um, In-demand jobs, new skills. Do we have, you know, that's the real issue. Do we have accurate labor market data to identify these in-demand jobs and skills that are needed to fill these jobs? And therefore, you know, the investments and the training comes from that. And then, you know, obviously, as Naomi said, workers needing upskilling and reskilling uh, to to go along with the with the transformation. Um, next slide, please. Tied in the states, uh, the states are very forward thinking on these issues. Uh, some more than others. Um, you know, given these economic realities, I think the states have really taken it upon themselves to lead the charge and begin preparing their workforces for the coming tide for this digital transformation. Washington State, I listed them first and foremost, they have done a remarkable job at getting ahead of this and wrapping their arms around it. They created a future of work uh, project several years ago, um, and they really had um, a great effort in terms of bringing everybody to the table. So legislators, representatives from organized labor, business leaders um, to address this, this problem and to begin making recommendations. Uh, they came out with a report that was submitted to their state legislature. I'm not quite sure where they are on that process today, but they were really, uh, you know, making a good faith effort at beginning to get something together to think about this. New Jersey's another great example. They too created a future of work uh, task force uh, on the research and analysis on the challenges and opportunities, opportunities presented by um, AI. Um, next slide, please. The list goes on. Pennsylvania um, created the Keystone Economic Development and Workforce Command Center. They, theirs is a mix of public and private partnership with labor and industry, too, to study these workforce needs and demands. California, Governor Newsom, he also established one of these workforce uh, uh, commissions to study the future of work, the impact of technology on work, workers, employers, jobs, and society. And um, you know, there are other states that have very similar efforts. I would also mention to you that the um, state chambers across the country are doing a very good job. There's a growing effort of some state chambers uh, taking on these issues. Uh, in fact, we are working with some of them on a massive research pro project or a repository, if you will, of um, some of these best practices and what states are doing uh, to, to reskill and upskill their workforces. Next slide, please. Insofar as the federal initiatives, um, there are some good things happening um, up on the Hill, Capitol Hill, there's a Congressional Future of Work Caucus that's being led uh, by um, representatives Lisa Blunt Rochester, Democratic from, uh, Democrat from Delaware, and Representative Brian Steele, a Republican from Wisconsin. So a good uh, bipartisan effort on the Hill to try to get at and study uh, 
the future of work issues. House Committee on Education and Labor, right before the pandemic um, started and everything shut, shut down in, in March of 2020, they held a hearing it's right before Christmas um, on the future of work. And they were really beginning to delve into this issue and had planned a series of hearings thereafter. But, you know, again, COVID sort of changed the trajectory and, and the priority on everything, but hopefully, you know, they will come back to it. And then lastly, I, I put here the, work the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA uh, reauthorization, as we all know it. Um, WIOA is up for reauthorization. Um, don't know if the Congress will get to it this year, perhaps next year. Maybe, maybe not, as you know, midterms elections are nearing the corner. Um, but it it certainly is an opportunity for lawmakers to really make some um, efforts toward expanding and strengthening uh, workforce development systems, and perhaps even appropriating additional uh, funding for um, for WIOA because WIOA money goes out, you know, to the states, to the to the workforce boards. And, uh, and that's how, you know, training gets disseminated, uh, dollars gets disseminated out into the states. Next slide, please. This slide, I think, is important uh, for a variety of, of reasons. It's the importance of labor force data. Um, I think that uh, understanding the complex dynamics of the U.S. labor market, which you know, has been con confounded by the, the impacts of COVID-19 and its displacement of workers is, is key to identifying in-demand jobs, the skills, um, guiding investments in education and training, and ultimately, I think, you know, the nation's economic recovery. So many workers were, were displaced and people have moved on. Some haven't moved on at all um, and have just dropped out of the, of, of the labor force. So here's the key. Effective use of labor market information and research is critical. It's critical for lawmakers to make wise uh, decisions and investments. It's critical for employers, for educators and others to make informed decisions, to guide resource allocation, and really, I think, ultimately achieve better employment outcomes. What is true is that, you know, even as the pandemic is raging on, hopefully we're nearing the end, um, and technological advances are made, the workplace, the workforce is, is going to continue to rapidly transform. Employers need the ability to leverage real-time, uh, economy-wide current data to inform better strategies and mitigate those associated risks. Uh, but, you know, people we talk to, educators, academia, employers we talk to, the requisite data is not there to respond to the labor situation and a federal solution is badly needed. Um, so, you know, I will talk to you more about some things that we're working on legislatively, but I also want to mention here that I think, you know, given the growing digitization of the labor markets, which includes, you know, social media sites, social networks, internet job postings, you know, everything is transforming resume sites. There's a constant source of new and current data that the federal government could capture and harness to provide more timely details of you know, occupational demand, including skills and certifications that are being sought. So I think there's a real um, need here to um, enhance and improve the labor force data that we're dealing with today. Next slide. So I come back to um, my organization, our coalition, and our advocacy initiatives and the projects that we're working on. It really has become um, a nationwide advocacy effort um, in partnership with companies and business across the country, different trade organizations, different trade groups here in Washington, D.C., but also around the states with the state chambers, as I mentioned, our research 
um, projects that, that are underway there and others. And, you know, we are engaged in an ongoing uh, legislative effort uh, to improve um, uh, the labor force data. It's a proposal that would um, make this uh, real time economy wide because we really are trying to get at supporting and identifying economy wide trends and emerging roles and the skills that are needed for these in demand jobs. Uh, I think that is, is one of the most critical things that we can do and improve on as we emerge out of this pandemic and try to get our economy um, uh, back and and hopefully as workers are re-entering the labor force and making sure that people have the skills necessary to take the in-demand jobs. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make sure that uh, we have time for uh, questions, and I think we will have plenty of time for questions. Um, sorry, I'm a little confused about. Uh, we will now um, uh, please do enter your questions into the chat, and uh, we will um, present it, share it with the, the speakers. Um, one question I have just to sort of get started is um, regarding, this is a question for Naomi, um, would you mind reflecting on the quality of um, the quality of the jobs that technological displacement creates? Um, you said that automation transforms jobs and may lead to employment growth. What types of jobs would it be for the workers? For example, algorithmic management could be considered a form of automation. It transforms the way, the, the way that tasks are performed. That doesn't mean that workers' uh, working conditions or occupational safety and health conditions are any better. In particular, for low-skilled workers, what would be their new reality with the uh, next job displacement that we're facing with automation? Um, thank you for your question. Um, that's a very good question. I think um, you know um, Shannon pointed out the fact that we don't have enough data uh, at this point to really um, have a good grip on what kinds of skills are being uh, required in the uh, workplace and what kinds of skills we need to give people for these new jobs. Um, I mean, there, there's, as I, I talked about, there's the promise of technology to make things better for people. And whether or not that's implemented is, um, I think, a matter of employees or employers um, it could be a regulatory matter. It could be other kinds of um, things that uh, allow um, the the sorts of um, the the kinds of jobs um, to be created that would be uh, better jobs for workers. Um, I don't. I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, Let's see, I, I, I I'll say that the question is a good one because there's concern about uh, you know economic polarization where the really high skill work work is being um, automated and the really low skill work is being uh, the, the middle um, the middle gap of uh, the economy having sort of a blank because uh, because there's you know um, a discrepancy in the types of work that is being uh, automated. Um, we have another question of, I think I'll ask this to both of you. Can you comment on how well the K, K through 12 uh, public the school, kindergarten through 12 system um, in the US is preparing students for lifelong learning? You know, I, I this is Shannon, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but, you know, I think in, in this country, but 
you know, I think that there are some other countries that are certainly doing a better job on their skilling and um, preparing their populations for, you know, effectively um, lifelong learning tools uh, and systems and, the, and, and, you know, doing a better job in terms of preparing their populations to sort of thrive in this digital economy. You know, I think about, you know, what is being done in countries like Belgium or Denmark, Finland, um, Netherlands. You hear a lot of times about, you know, what these countries are doing to get ahead in terms of their skills and their effective lifelong learning systems. I don't know that that has sort of caught on in this country. I don't know that those investments are being made, but certainly you know, I think that is the key to the 21st century is providing these lifelong learning accounts or lifelong learning uh, systems. And I, my opinion would be the earlier that that begins, uh, the better that we are educating the children uh, to take the jobs for the future. Thank you. Yeah, um, good point about what other countries are doing and one of the uh, audience members posted a good uh, link to um, work that is being done, documents that have been developed in uh, England by the British Trade Union Congress, where they have workers at the table and they're developing guidance on having good dignified work and um, thinking about the worker experience. We'll follow up a little more on that. Um, it's sort of the same type of questions of, what kind of skills and training do you think worker safety and health professionals would need to prepare for the disrupt the developing instruction? Naomi, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly they're going to have to um, be made aware of the different types of technological changes that are occurring and the potential um, uh, safety and health um, risks that they may pose to workers, if any, or the benefits that they pose to workers. Um, and I think um, some sort of knowledge of what the trends are looking like going into the future. Yeah, and I think uh, we did publish a NIOSH uh, Future Work Initiative, publish a uh, research agenda and also a foundational paper. And those really outline the things that we see as uh, needs for the future to fill in the gaps that we have. Another question is, uh, do we know what efforts are underway to establish the means of tracking the mix and the shifts in the needed skills and certification based on online hiring activities? So we know from you know online information what's going on in terms of who, who and what is being hired. How does that reflect uh, the trends and the gaps that exist? Do we know anything about that, Naomi or Shannon? I mean, I think that's something that's missing. I think that's something that that needs to be course corrected. I think that we need to, you know, that's what I was sort of getting at in terms of improving the labor market debt. I think we need to to improve our efforts um, because, you know, unless you can you you can identify you know, I, I will go back to the restaurant industry. You know, a lot of people ended up leaving. We do we know where do we can we guess where people went? Yes, but do we know? No, we do not. Do, and you know, and you know, I think more and more employers are making uh, smart investments, and I think we are at this really pivotal time now. You know, to help more people reap the benefits of this digital transformation and really reduce, you know, further reduce the unemployment and the risk of automation, you know, really widening the inequities that in inequalities that exist in this country and that are driving unemployment. I think we've really got to get out ahead of improving this labor market data and mapping these skills and uh, opportunities for the future. Thank you. And um, as you were talking about legislation and reg regulations, um, how do you see existing labor law, specifically bargaining agreements, 
um, being applied to these new information centric technologies versus more traditional physical technologies. I, I don't have a comment on that. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. I'm going to see if Naomi, if you have any comments. No pressure. Just want to check. Um, no, I not on that one. No. Great. Thanks. Um, to follow up a little bit on um, what uh, it was shared regarding the British uh, trade union, what suggestions do you have for how to ensure that workers are at the table when we're thinking about um, technological job displacement? Um, Naomi, I guess I'll start with you because you know at NIOSH everything we do has tried part time. We want workers and employers at the table. How do we make sure that workers are engaged and are part of the solution um, when we're thinking about these things? Um, I think that it's important to encourage employers when they're thinking about um, implementing new types of technology into the workplace to get the workers involved up front, to let them know um, what kinds of technology that they're considering putting in the workplace and why, and then have those workers involved in actually implementing that technology in the workplace, um, figuring out what kinds of skills or upskilling uh, requirements are needed. And um, I, I just think it's very important for workers to be involved um, from the beginning in those kinds of efforts. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes left. Uh, Shannon, can you explain a little more about the types of activities that the ML Coalition is involved in? Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, we are uh, flexing a major uh, legislative initiative to develop federal legislation that would be introduced in a bipartisan manner to get at what I have been you know, talking to you about is improving the labor market data. We're also involved with um, some of the state chambers on a research project I mentioned uh, that's essentially gonna serve as a repository of uh, the best of the best practices, what some of the states are doing in this area. I mentioned Washington State, they have, you know, for, you know I think they're doing a remarkable job um, trying to um, make these investments. And the other thing is I'm going to be a strong advocate for making reforms to WIOA when it becomes reauthorized in terms of making sure that, you know, um, there's adequate funding going toward some of these things that we mentioned here today and that people are focused on, you know, the skills gap and members of con Congress are paying attention to making wise federal investments and actually closing that skills gap and making sure those federal dollars are going to the states in a way that they can use them and you know that are going to ultimately benefit uh, their constituents and the people that are trying to get back into the to the labor force and you know six and 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 rebound from where we have been during this pandemic yeah that's um that'll be really useful and, and um, important um in I said I'm from the Office for uh, Total Worker Health, and uh, you know we talk about having this comprehensive approach to worker safety, health, and well-being, and includes things such as you know having uh, good organizational work so people have uh, flexible flexibility and control of their own time and schedule, but also more comprehensive things such as you know policies that provide you know benefits and fair wages and living wages, and um, people being able to have workers at the at the table so that they're able to play a role in the decision making and um, do you see um, either of you but I could start with Naomi how do you think these types of issues will change with a uh, technological job displacement um, if if there's a concern about with workers who are losing who are concerned about losing their jobs um, is this going to make it tougher for workers to get uh, the things that they want to have, you know, a living wage and have safety at work? Or would it be the reverse that because there's right now a labor shortage, um, the workers would actually have more leverage in getting these things that make for safe and healthy working conditions? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Um. 
I'm actually, um, I'm actually going to turn this over to Shannon because I think she probably has more thoughts and experience um, with that question than me. So Cha Cha, give me the question again, please. Um, given the, the labor shortage and the great resignation, I guess in essence, um, what could employers do to remain competitive in this economy? As you said, you know, people are quitting their jobs. How could employers ensure that they right. are? Right. Well, I, I think you know what you see employers, many employers doing today. Um, is people are getting competitive on pay. People are being competitive on overall compensation, including benefits. And I also think you see more and more employers being, um, you know, have putting emphasis on flexibility. Um, a lot of hybrid work schedules and uh, a lot of, you know, it's an employee market and employees are demanding the, the flexibility, the work-life balance that, you know, is so still so badly needed as we, you know, try to rebound from all of this. So I do think, you know, uh, they're getting competitive on wages and overall compensation packages. Great, thank you. I'll end with uh, just a couple more questions. What are some of the technological changes that the occupational safety and health profession has experienced over the past uh, couple of decades? And what lessons do you think we could learn and take from that about future changes? I'm sorry, um, could you repeat that question? I didn't quite catch it. Sure. Um, what changes has the occupational safety and health profession experienced over the last couple, two or three decades? And how do you think we can apply those experiences uh, and lessons learned when we're thinking about future changes? Uh, uh, we can certainly get back to you, but, but I think um, some of the changes have been, you know, there's increasing awareness of safety and health issues, and there's now more data available, you know, more real-time monitoring of data of, you know, occupational safety and health conditions. And, um, and I think that could be useful in the future. As Naomi pointed out, one of the benefits of more information is that we could track um, better how workers are doing and what's, uh, what they're facing. And that could be a good opportunity going forward in the future. Uh, we are out of time. I want to give a warm thanks to Naomi and Shannon for your thoughtful presentations and to Kiana Harper for logistical support and all of our attendees for joining the NASH Future of Work webinar. Uh, please do visit our website to stay up to date on our activities. Um, and thank you again. I hope everyone has a good, safe and healthy uh, few weeks until our next webinar. Thank you.